Hey, good morning. Welcome to the last Sunday in March here at Genesis Church. I'm going to give a couple minutes for everybody to get on. Uh, we're outside this morning, so we've got the birds and the bees, and like my honey said, the pollen in the trees. So if there's a little sneezing going on or you hear a racket behind you, all the boys are outside with us this morning. Braden is a member of the volunteer member of the Honey Path Fire Department. He's out uh, running a call with the fire department, so our uh, production support service is being diminished by 50%. And so you could hear a little bit of racket, but it's okay. Everybody's enjoying a good spring day. Uh, Y'all, I uh, just want to give an update on our building and want to start off again by just saying thank you to each and every board member and my honey Lisa. We are successfully out of the building. Everything has been moved into storage. Um, Mac and Suzanne have notified the, real, the realty company. All the utilities have been cut off and it's a bittersweet moment. We had many, many, the Holy Spirit was at that little building many times and I was blessed to be a part of it. But there's going to be a new season for Genesis Church. And a blessing from God came last night. We had reached out to some friends of ours that owned the Crow family, that owned the Crow family farms in Donald, South Carolina. The farm is a wedding and event venue. And I have uh, been blessed to know Rick and Debbie Crow and Cassie Edders, their daughter, uh, for years. They're close uh, close friends of our family and asked Cassie about if the farm might be available for next Sunday and for an Easter service, a live Easter service, and we would still continue the Facebook, but uh, Cassie and them were very gracious, very gracious to help us. And um, so we're going to have a live Easter service and it's going to be a little change in time from 11 to 12 because the farm is located in Donald's and we want to give folks a little extra time to get there. And I'll be posting the address for it in my post and then Suzanne will also send out a, uh, Suzanne will also send out a, te uh, like a text as well. And we'll try and get everybody to know uh, where it's at. But we just can't wait to see y'all. You don't, as hard as it's been for y'all, I've been about to stand on my head because I need y'all. I need y'all. I do this for God. It's God, God to call me, but I need y'all, and this just ain't the same. And as far as a more permanent location, we have several, several feelers and inquiries out. Uh, we're actually going to look at a potential rental building this afternoon, and hopefully there'll be more on all this to come. Y'all just bear with us. There may be some Sundays we may even have to meet in a park. We may be have church, we'll travel for a little bit, but it'll be okay as long as we're together. Because we want Genesis to be a house of prayer, and we want it to be a hospital for people who need Jesus, and we all do, because we're all hot messes, and we want to be able to get together with each other, support each other with what we're going through, and hear God's words, not mine. So again, I just want to say thank you so much to each and every board member. They've given up their time, they've given up their finances, they've given up their efforts to make this possible. You may not realize in this virtual state, or people that hadn't been in church for a while, just how amazing it is to have a board like this. And we're gonna meet after the service today. In some churches, folks are long on talk and short on walk, but I am so blessed to be a part of this church. Lisa and I and Brayden are so blessed to be a part of this church with the board members like you have here. And they have all rose to the occasion so many times and there's so many things that you will never hear about that they've helped people. And I'm not saying it just cause they're listening, but we love y'all and we love each and every one of you that's listening to this. And we hope that you'll come out and see us next Sunday at the Crow Farms. And that if you have an event in mind, contact Cassie. They're on Facebook. Uh, they're on the internet. I've had the pleasure of officiating uh, three or four events there now. They want your special. They want your special day to be as special as they would want theirs. And uh, 
Um, guys, I can't think about any, can't think of any more announcements right now. Prayer list. Y'all, if there's anyone uh, um, um, that you'd like to request prayer for, have a praise report, please enter it in the comments, uh, message me, text me, email me. Our My email address is on the church website. And you can always email me there. Uh, you can text me. And um, there are a couple of folks I'd like to remember. I'd like to lift up... Um, I'm having a complete, this is why Lisa asked me if I needed to write notes this morning, is she's over there just that special smile, you were right dear, and um, I would like to lift up the family of Cindy McCarty, and I can't remember Nancy's last name right now, and I'm so sorry Cindy, but Cindy's mom Nancy is in the hospice house right now, and Cindy and her husband Buster and their family have been taking care of Nancy through her battle with cancer. And we just want to lift them up. We want to continue to lift up the family of, uh, we want to continue to lift up Phyllis Waller as she's recovering from a blood clot and rehab. We also want to continue to lift up Janet Harkey and her family. And in the midst of their loss, they have gotten a blessing. Chris and Hope are expecting uh, another addition to the Harkey herd. And uh, we're just excited for them. They're wonderful parents, they have a great family. And we're just excited about this blessing for them. Y'all, let's go to prayer before we go to our message. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, today is the anniversary of Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Father, several short days later, he will be on the cross. And Father, as we look at those last words that Jesus made on the cross, we just, even in pain, even in suffering, Jesus' words are lessons for us. And Father, we want his words and your message to be heard, not mine. Because Father, we're all fighting battles. We're all in struggle, some major, some minor, but we're all dealing with things. Father, please let your words be heard. Let it touch the hearts it needs to touch. Father, and let it go into our hearts like a candle into a lantern to shine out into this dark world that needs your light more than ever that that's the only thing that will drive out the spiritual darkness in this world in Jesus name we pray amen well y'all we're going to continue our message here words on the cross and this is part three of this sermon and sermon series and I'm going to have to pray about what to speak about for Easter I don't know if we'll continue this series or if we're going to go in another direction, Holy Spirit knows and he'll point me in it. To me, this is one of the most powerful sections of scripture in the Gospels. And that's saying something. Jesus was almost at the point of death. And the section of scripture we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 45. And we're going to go through each verse this week where it's going to be a little different than what we've done the previous weeks. Verse 45, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. Imagine, close your eyes and imagine you're on a hill outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's population is swollen up due to the Passover. 20 times what it normally is. There's hundreds of thousands of people there. You're hearing the crying and moaning of men being crucified all around you. It's in the middle of the day. Then it turns to night. And it stays that way for three hours. It wasn't a sandstorm. It wasn't a regular storm. It wasn't an eclipse. The reason why I say it wasn't an eclipse is the Passover, the Passover feast always occurs at the time of a full moon. An eclipse can't happen at a full moon. The longest eclipse can only last for a few minutes. This lasted until for three hours. And the sixth hour and ninth hour with Matthew, you have to remember Matthew was Jewish. So he, his units of time, everything was based on the Jewish calendar and Jewish traditions. <clears throat> so the sixth hour 
and ninth hour, same thing as 12, 12 noon to 3 in the afternoon. This was even written about in a source independent of the Bible. There was a, I've heard, Greek and Roman historian named Plehon who wrote about an eclipse that took place at the time Jesus was crucified. And this was confirmed in the imperial records. But it wasn't an eclipse. What caused this darkness? It wasn't that the sun went down. It just stopped shining. There was darkness at noontime. Darkness in the place of the sun. Some people say that the darkness was nature's reaction to the sufferings of our Savior. I think that, that three hour darkness period came from God. In the beginning, remember, there was only darkness till God brought out the light. And God used three days of darkness as one of his plagues in Egypt. It almost broke Pharaoh. The Egyptians were in total darkness while the Israelites were in the night, were in the light. And I think that God was reminding those people on that hill, those people in Jerusalem, of the darkness of their lives without the hope of salvation through Jesus. Jesus' life in many details of his life and ministry were foretold in Scripture. And I learned something yesterday. This event was foretold 800 years before the birth of Jesus. Amos, they call them minor prophets. It's a group of books of, towards the end of the, new, of the Old Testament. It's not that the prophecies were minor. It's just they didn't have a lot of writing. That's why they were called minor prophets and other prophets were called major prophets. God spoke through, to Amos. And it's recorded in Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. And it will come about on that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. And I will turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into songs of mourning. And I will put sackcloth around everyone's waist and baldness on every head. Sackcloth, being dressed in sackcloth, ashes, pulling out your hair were Jewish signs of grief. And I will make it like a time of mourning. And that's mourning with you. For an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. The festival of Passover is the most important festival in the Jewish tradition. This was written 800 years ago. Before Jesus was born. God brought the Israelites out of the darkness of slavery in Egypt. Now Jesus was bringing the whole world out of the darkness of damnation and struggle and sin. I think there's meaning in this time of darkness and that is written about in this verse for us. And how many of us feel like we're in a time of emotional and spiritual darkness, either internal or external? Look out. Look outside. And what's going on? On top of that, look what's going on inside. Isn't it a struggle between doing what's right in God's eyes and doing what is right in the world's eyes? If we're all honest, it's a struggle for all of us. Those three hours probably felt like they would never end. Those people in Jerusalem. Even Jesus chose not to avoid the darkness in his life, in this life. He could have, but he didn't. Verse 45 reminds us that we'll all go through dark periods in this life. All of us will. But the darkness ends, just like this three-hour period did. In the ninth hour, reading out of verse 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachina. And that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These, this was not the first time these words were written in Scripture. The anguish of Jesus was foretold by David in Psalm 22, verse 1. 
written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my help are the words of my groaning. You recall a time when you felt abandoned. In pain and alone, all of your friends are almost all them gone. Only one disciple and his mother Mary and a couple more followers were there. Jesus had hundreds of followers at one point in time. Abandoned by almost everyone you knew. And you think, close your eyes, think about to a time like that. Now try to multiply it by hundreds or thousands of times, millions of times, that sorrow. Then you might in some way start to understand the suffering Jesus was going through. Because it was more than physical suffering. Jesus took on billions and billions of sins that weren't his own. And what's significant about that? In Romans 6.23, Paul wrote about the results of sin and spiritual and spiritual death. Death is the absence of life. Sorry, we're having a young one come up to the altar. <clears throat> spiritual death is the absence of spiritual life. It's separation from God. Jesus allowed himself to be separated from God for these three hours. Some of us may think that God has abandoned us or abandoned us at times. We've never gone through a period in our life in this world that God has been, you know, we have been separated from God. It may feel it, you may argue with me, but no. Jesus suffered physical and spiritual death on the cross. And that's what happened to Jesus on Golgotha during those times, during those three hours. And imagine the sins of the world, not just the people that were living in that time, but everyone that's been born since. All the sins are piled on top of him. And while that was happening, and Jesus was bearing spiritual death for the first time in his existence, he found himself separated from God. I would cry out to, why have you forsaken me? Paul again writes about eternal punishment for the lost in this way in 2 Thessalonians 2.19. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of God. That's what Jesus suffered on the cross in those three day, in those three hours. And being separated from God also meant that he suffered the full wrath of Satan during those three hours. I cannot imagine the loneliness, the pain, the struggle that he felt. In the awfulness of those hours, Jesus felt a suffering worse than the physical trauma of the nails in his hands and his feet. The suffolk slow, slow asphyxiation or suffocation. He felt forsaken. Jesus suffered those three hours in that hell so that we wouldn't suffer an eternity in hell. Jesus was God and man for him. He knew what had to be done and what was going to happen. But he felt alone and abandoned in those three hours. Almost all of his earthly friends had ran away in immense pain. And for a moment he cried out to God the Father and asked why we cried out for less. And if we're honest, we think it, we say it. We wonder why we're going through the trials and the pain. Even though we know God's there, we all have our breaking points. And we're not alone. David, Saul, Solomon, Jacob, Peter, Paul. They saw the miracles of God firsthand. Many of them performed the miracles of God. And they doubted, they broke. 
I think it's important in this verse to look at who Jesus cried out to and how. My God, my God. Jesus didn't call out to those around him. He didn't call out to his army of angels that could have delivered him at any point in time he wished. Jesus didn't reject God because of the pain and the suffering. He claimed God is my God. The pain that Jesus was experiencing, it didn't come from God, it came from us. We put those nails in his hands. My sinfulness, and I'll admit I'm a sinner, we all are. Any pastor that gets up here and looks down there knows anybody else, they're delusional. We're all sinners. We're all hot messes. We all put those nails in his hands and feet. We leveled that cross up. We all did. The pain that you're going through didn't come from God. It came, comes from sin. When sin was released in this world, misery, disease, death, pain, all came along with it. God didn't do that. Maybe you're walking around and wondering why God let it happen. God has an overall end to all of this. But even Jesus said there's suffering in this world and there's no way to get around it. He couldn't even get around it. So we can't. When you are out there, and I don't know, it's laid on my heart that somebody that's listening to this is walking around and they're saying, God, why did you forsake me? Remember Jesus' answer. My God, my God. He held on to his God. Even during this immense struggle, this pain that we cannot even begin to imagine. Then looking at verses 47 through 49. And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it said, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see if Elijah comes to save him. Let's think about this situation. Five days before this, Jesus was welcomed into Palm Sunday, which is today, as a hero. Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. Palm leaves spread out as he fulfilled hundreds of years of prophecy, riding in on a colt. We still celebrate Palm Sunday to this day. Several days later, these same people called for his death and the release of a murderer. He had done no wrong. They spit on him. They threw rocks at him. They kicked him. They beat him. They laughed at him while he drugged that heavy cross on that whipped, broken back. They were blind. They mocked him. Yet he stayed on that cross. There's still those that mock Jesus and mock those that follow him. Jesus died for the atheist. He died for those that want to remove God. From every part of our society. He died for those that want to change God's word. And want to turn it into an instrument of hate. Which has never been. He died for the prisoner. He died for the holy roller. That worships God. With their lips. But their hearts are far away. He died for all those. And through his suffering. And through his sacrifice. He provided forgiveness. For all those who receive him. He still mocked today. Even so, he uses people. He uses the Holy Spirit to reach out to a lost world just as he did all those years ago. Even down to his last dying words. And he continues to suffer the ridicule of those who refuse to accept the forgiveness and victory he offers. And why does that happen? Why does a lost world reject a Savior, the Savior, blind him, 
we're born with a sin nature and sin's out in this world and there is spiritual evil in this world some people may laugh at me there is spiritual evil that crosses over into a physical realm Paul talks about it in Ephesians he also talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God the God Paul is talking about of this world is Satan Satan was one of God's high angels he fell he hates everything with God we are all born with a tiny piece of the image of God in us there are people out there who actually worship Satan it's a tax-deductible religion by the IRS they're fooled into thinking that when they leave this world nothing's gonna happen to them they're blinded by the father of lies and he's not only in satanic churches he's in plenty of Christian churches arguments over small things that the Bible said this but we really need to take an interpretation of it and Jesus didn't really die on the cross that's just figurative no if you don't think he's out there and trying to destroy everything trying to win every just destroy every soul and blind everyone I don't know what else to show you other than the evening news. If that doesn't convince you, I don't know what else will. The good news is, we don't have to stay in this darkness. Satan's defeated. He's in this world, but he is defeated. Jesus died on Calvary at Golgotha. So that we can have everlasting life and never be separated from him never the one that suffered for men is our salvation he offered himself up to those that killed him he's still seeking to offer himself up to those Probably some people that are listening to this right now. He loves us in the hot mess we are. I hear people that want to get their lives in order and then come to church. No. He loves us in the mess we are. He went through that darkness, that pain for us. And we have a choice. Do we continue to reject him? Or do we answer his knock at the door and receive him? Then in verse 50, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. His broken, battered, bloody body was taken from the cross. It was prepared according to Jewish traditions. This body, riddled with wounds and trauma, was placed in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. A member of the Sanhedrin, ruling Jewish council, who was secretly a follower of Jesus, and foretold, and prophecy was fulfilled with that, that he would be laid in the tomb of a rich man. But it's okay, it was a borrowed tomb. He only needed it for three days. He only needed it for three days. Jesus died that we might live, not just in this world, but in the next. We will have eternal life. It will either be in hell, separated from God, and that's true hell, the separation from God, or with God everlasting. If you've never received Christ, won't you receive him today? And maybe you did. I know I was baptized in 1994, and I fell away from God. I fell away from him. I rejected him. I was that person. My hand might as well have been throwing a rock after I put the hammer down. He still loved me. He still loves you. If you have fallen away, 
Put down the shame. Put it down. And come to Jesus. I want to leave you with a true story about people who committed themselves to Jesus and they went through the darkness, the mocking, and the pain. They were known as the 40 Martyrs of Sebasti. These were members, 40 members of the 12th Legion of Rome's Imperial Army. That was their go-to unit. And there were 40 soldiers who had professed to be Christians and professed their faith in Jesus Christ. The emperor at the time, Licinius, sent out an order that none of the soldiers in his army could be Christian and they had to worship the pagan gods of Rome. These 40 warriors said, you can have our armor and our bodies, but our hearts belong to Jesus. All 40 were marched into a frozen lake. Ice had been busted open in the middle of winter. They were stripped of their clothes before they, and any time they were told they could renounce Christ and be spared from death, all 40 of them huddled together and started singing Christian hymns. That night, which was down below freezing, 39 men fell to their icy graves. One got out and renounced Christ. The officer in charge of guarding all these men in the lake had secretly come to believe in Jesus. He took off his armor, he took off his clothes, and he joined his fallen comrades. In the morning, there were 40 bodies that gave their all for Christ. They carried their crosses. They faced their three hours of darkness. They were mocked by their friends and fellow soldiers. They were outcast, and they faced death with the knowledge that their time of darkness would end, and they weren't alone. They put their lives in Jesus' hands. Ask yourself, would I? Let's get to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Father, maybe we're going through our period of darkness. Maybe we're feeling alone right now. Father, it's been laid on my heart. Somebody needs to hear this, need to hear this message and be reminded they're not alone. The darkness will end. The pain will end. Father, help them to feel you. When they cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remind them they're not alone. And Father, like these soldiers who were not afraid, they were not afraid to show they were Christians in a non-Christian world. They were not afraid to stand up for you because you stood up for them and for all of us. Father, let us be men and women of courage. Let us be men and women of God. Not hypocritical, not looking down our nose, but doing the right things for the right reasons. Let us live our lives as business cards for you. Let us use what we have been given by the Holy Spirit to bring people to Jesus in our own way. Might be through our words, might be through our actions, it might be through listening, it might be all the above. Touch each and every person listening to this. Use them, work through them, Father, so that we can have more light in this world and less darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our benediction this week comes from Romans 8, verses 38-39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Love y'all. Have a great week, and I hope to see as many of you as we can in person. And we're going to continue the Facebook services, but we're hoping to see so all of our family out there. And by family, I mean Genesis Church family. And if you have only been listening to us like online and you can make the trip, come on. We love you. If you can't, that's all right. We love you anyway. Have a great week.